Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our latest Erwin Mitchell tax webinar. Uh, it's, my name is John Bunker. It's my pleasure to be your host for today. And uh, uh, in a moment, I'll introduce you to my fellow speakers. But thank you very much for joining us. It's really good to have you with us. And uh, we hope we're going to give you something to really interest you in the next hour. Um, we are addressing some of the three big issues, uh, three of the big issues about estate planning at the moment. I'm going to speak in a moment about um, the whole problem of bank of mum and dad or bank of family, you know, the whole business of getting young adults on the housing ladder. Um, and that is something which is very much an interdisciplinary area for all the professionals to work together. Um, then Naomi is going to address the question of pensions and, um, and potential changes coming up in April. So that's also got a topical edge to it. And then Ian's going to deal with something which is a bit of a niche, but we think a really important one because uh, it's an area which is perhaps slightly underutilized, the Disabled Persons Trust, um, beneficiaries who can get some really Really significant tax breaks that Ian will talk about um, if in the right circumstances. So we hope all of that will be of interest and value to you. Um, I haven't got on here, but we will have, of course, a Q&A at the end. So there's a Q&A box. If you have any questions, please do put them in there. We'd be most grateful uh, to have your questions. Um, we will send the slides around straight after the recording. So please don't worry, you will get all those slides. Um, and uh, and also we will give you a feedback form at the end, a chance to to give your response and comments on, on what we did or didn't do so well. So uh, let's go to our speakers and um, uh, please to introduce two of my uh, my fellow speakers. Um, uh, Naomi Neville is the head of our lifetime and estate planning team in Chichester uh, and um, it, she and uh, Ian are both partners of the firm. Ian is the partner who is the life, head of the lifetime and estate planning team in the Birmingham office. So uh, we are, um, I'm pleased to have uh, two of our partners with us today and then the next we will be able to show on our next slide um, actually the, the geographical spread across the country because uh, as you will see here we have offices around the country including Birmingham and Chichester uh, where Naomi and Ian are based but also in lots of other places uh, as well. Um, so um, let us then get straight into my my subject which is the bank of mum and dad and um, the legal and tax issues, uh, the main issues in helping family get started on the housing ladder. Um, if I uh, give you an index just to show you what I'm going to be covering, um, uh, the context, uh, some of the questions and, and key facts that arise from a really, really useful report from the Legal and General that came out at the very end of August. Um, then we will address um, the question of, of is it a gift, is it a loan, that sort of key issue about helping adult children buy property. And then consider two alternative ways of doing it, the loan option and how that might work and some of the issues there, particularly about mortgage lenders and about how it works on a divorce. And then the, OK, if you're going to give a gift, how can you also make a gift that is in some way protected uh, in the event of a divorce or something and something that needs asset protection? So I will look at those alternatives uh, uh, then. I finish with a little bit of practice point, but the overriding thing here is there is a great opportunity here for all of us to work together. Um, I know many of you on this call will be tax advisors, financial planners, wealth managers, and, and if you are in that whole world where you're seeing clients and, and clients are talking to you about this, there's a great opportunity for us to, to pick up and advise on the need for advice. So let's get straight then into my, my first slide where um, we say, is it the bank of mum and dad or is it now the bank of family? The phrase that the legal and general used because it's all sorts of relationships within families that are helping people uh, to get on the housing ladder. Uh, I do commend the, the report to you. I found it really interesting to read and it, there's some really good stuff in there. Um, so what I want to do is explore the, the key legal and tax issues uh, and see ways in which we can work together because that interdisciplinary work is so important here. So on my next slide I have the um, extract from the legal and general report and in there it talks about um, ensuring bank of family lenders, well begs a big question but we'll come to that, 
lenders get appropriate guidance from professionals, both to avoid putting themselves in difficulty through their generosity and to make sure their help is delivered in the most efficient way for all parties. So I totally agree. Really, really good to quote that, but it begs three big questions. Firstly, can we get the clients to take time and to pay for fees? Uh, I am very conscious from all my years as a partner with the firm where I saw clients doing conveyancing, that conveyancing has a kind of time critical element. And, and that whole drive to, you know, the, the daughter who says, oh, mum, don't please don't stop me. This is the flat I've always wanted to have. I've been waiting so many years to get my own flat. I just need to get on with it. Just let me just give me the money and let me get on with it. You know, that's one first issue. Can they can we encourage them to spend time and money um, actually just taking stock? Secondly, is there one most efficient way? No, there isn't. There isn't because there's lots of different interests. So we need to see the, the needs for separate advice from the different people involved. And then thirdly, of course, is it a loan? You know, it's, you know, lenders is a very easy term to use. Uh, is it a loan and how does that work with the, 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 the other lenders, the mortgage lenders, which is one of the big practical issues? So I now go on to some key facts uh, of from the legal and general report. And I thought this was a really, really interesting stat here. Legal and general said 47% of all homes purchased by buyers under the age of 55 are supported by the bank of family. That's not under the age of 35, under the age of 45, it's under the age of 55, nearly half of those transactions are supported by the bank of family. Now that's a very big number of purchases and the, the stats on here say that through that the average support is 25 and a half thousand which is three quarters of the average deposit. Um, now you know that is you know the average deposit for a first time buyer. Um, so you know, there's a very significant amount of people needing the help uh, or need you know really involved in this it's a big market and I've put a few more stats there for you to read at your leisure um, as you'll see from my slides there is a lot of detail which I won't go through at all because you'll have all the slides to look at later but if we go on to my next slide it I've what I have picked out is two key things about the need for the advice the first and this is quite worrying only a quarter of people who helped family actually sought financial advice before doing so. I mean, that's that's terrible. That's really disappointing that so few people took financial advice. Um, and secondly, only 12% sought professional advice about how they do so. Something that would have very significant effects for a lot of people and left a lot of people without due consideration of their own future needs. Now, how it's done is critically important, as I hope to show you in the next 15 minutes. But, but you know, the, the thing is, here, here is a need for advice. And I say at the top, there's great potential for us to offer help proactively. That's all of us. It's you and, and, and we, because, because many of you are having contact with clients and there's an opportunity to say, actually, you do need some advice on this. Let, you know, we can the convincing can go ahead, but let's just take stock of how we're doing this, uh, and 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 really take that advice. Um, there's a question that somebody posed post, which was, uh, what will happen with the autumn statement on the 22nd of November? And on BOMAD, there's one particular thing that Martin Lewis, the journalist, has said he sees coming because he's heard on the on his contacts that that something about first time buyers will be in the the, uh, the the autumn statement next Wednesday in eight days time. What Martin Lewis says is that the thing most needed is a change to the provisions for licenses for lifetime ISAs. That the current cap of 450,000 when you're buying a property, he says needs to be um, needs to be released because a third of all first time buyers are having to pay over 450 over, over that cap limit and and the only way they can draw their lifetime ISA money out is is by paying a penalty which he says is totally totally unfair given the way the housing market has changed since Lysas first came in. So um, that's one thing he's advocating for and an example of where 
the person doing the buying needs some financial advice, but we also need to think about the financial advice the parents may need or the family may need. So going on to 1.5, we raise the critical question of what is the form of the financial help being given? I've had many clients over the years who've said to me, I'm going to lend some money to my daughter or my son because they're buying a property and it's very exciting. And, you know, and, and, and I've said, oh, that's great. Really good. When are they going to repay it? Oh, no, 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 no. They're not going to repay it. No, no, no. Well, if they're not going to repay it, is it a loan? That's the question. And, and that needs a bit of unpacking to actually think, do you need that money back? And if so, when and how's that going to be done? Or is it actually a gift? So that, that's the first fundamental question. And I think those are the two options that most of us will be seeing in practice. You know, some of us will have been used to the, the old practice where somebody might buy a share of equity. A parents might invest in the property effectively. That's really shut off now by SDLT. Who wants to pay an extra 3% higher rate additional dwellings charge uh, on the whole purchase price because the parents have already got their own home? So in practice, that's not an option. Um, what we need to think is what are the tax issues, but also let's just have reference to asset protection. Clients, many, many clients are really worried about that. Is there a risk with the child's partner that actually the money might all be lost in some divorce or, or kind of financial dispute. So actually we need to be careful of that. So on 1.6, we go on to um, the question of, of the advantage of a gift. Okay, you know, uh, there is an advantage, at least with a gift rather than a loan, that you are setting a seven year clock running. You are making a gift and, and, and if you live seven years, it will be, be tax free, that's great. So that's really positive and that's something therefore that we would advocate. But there is the risk of the asset protection element that goes with that. So let's see uh, on 1.7 those concerns. The um, reluctance of many parents, um, research says it's one in three. Some people would say it's more than that. One in three parents not prepared to help their children because of this concern. So as lawyers, we'd say, well, let's find a legal solution. Let's find a way to do that. And I want to explore with you the two options, the loan option. We've got a couple of slides to talk about whether the how you might make a loan work. And then the alternative here um, that the parents uh, could offer a gift on the basis of one of three options. Now, spoiler alert here, I'm not going to say all three of them work. As one of them, I'm going to recommend more than the other two, but we'll come to that. Let's look at loans first. So um, uh, if we see on 1.8, the um, uh, question, is it genuinely repayable? Now, the problem, and we've many of us will have come across that, the problem of the lender requiring a form to be signed that says all the money that's used is a gift, no loans. And that is a problem. If you sign that, you can't then turn around later and say, well, actually, it was really a loan. Uh, it's a, it, a, it could be said it's a fraud, but also it, it, it's just going to be looked straight through on a divorce. It's not going to work. So um, the, um, we, we, the, the, the strong advice to clients should be do not sign that form if it is really a loan. Um, but how could it work? How could it work with the lender? Well, I think the important thing to think about is the, um, the, the, the guidance issued by a divorce court. Uh, and I've mentioned at the bottom of the slide the case of last year of P&Q, where the divorce court set out the, the, the criteria for hard loans and soft loans. Hard loans are those which they take into account as an obligation that is factored into the, the figures when the judge does the, 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 the divorce settlement. Soft loans are the ones that the judge will simply disregard and look straight through. So we want to find a way to ensure that the loan we've got is a hard loan that can be enforced. And on 1.9, we will see that, you know, okay, if it's in writing and negotiated between two parties who have independent advice, then it can stand up as a hard loan. It can be legally enforceable. And that's the really important thing. And then we say, well, what do we then say to the lender? Well, I think we've got to try and do two things. 
if there are no monthly payments being made by the child or the child and their partner, then then it's not messing with their ability to to pay the mortgage payments. So that's the first thing. You know, if that's the case, we can emphasize that there's no there's no payments being made. So therefore, it's not stopping them from paying the mortgage. Secondly, the fact that they've put in some money that, you know, that the second loan gives you maybe 20 percent or whatever of the property means that you've then got a, a mortgage loan of 80 percent, which is much safer for you as a as a prime lender, the first lender. Their equity is much greater. They've got nothing to worry about. They've got the first charge on the property and there's nothing to worry about. And we've got to try and see if we can encourage clients to kind of to, to, to do that. And I, I've had situations where, you know, I've encouraged them people to tough that out with the with the lender. But you've got to get beyond the first, uh, you know, form filling exercise and get to somebody who can make a decision and say, yeah, actually, we've got we've got plenty of security there. We're OK. The question then is, uh, can the parents loan be protected by a second charge? Now, the lenders may not agree to that, but if they can, then it would really work. And that's really helpful. You know, but we, we, that may not be, be possible, but if it can, so much the better. So going on, let's look at the other options then. And those other options are what are the three things that we might do? And lawyers might say, we like trusts. We might say trusts are an option. That's that's a good solution to the problem. Let's set up a lifetime trust and make a gift to a trust, not to the individual, and then it's secure, and then we're okay, and so on. So um, that 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 would be my first instinctive uh, uh, suggestion. Um, but the divorce court may look straight through the trust. I understand from divorce uh, family colleagues that that. What tends to happen in divorce court is they don't tend to interfere with the, the trust, but they would tend to make an assumption that the person who's the beneficiary of the trust has that resource. They've got it, so actually they need less of the rest of the pot. So what it does is to divvy up the, the rest of the pot on the assumption that that, that money for the trust is always there, which is you know, defeating the purpose. So actually it doesn't work it, I mean, it might work slightly better if it's a pre-existing trust and you could say have grandparents discretionary trust or something particularly if there are other people actually benefiting but that's not the solution so maybe the prenup or postnup is a better solution so let's look at that one um, if we go to 1.11 we see the prenup um, if someone has is, is about to get married or postnup if they're already married um, and following the Supreme Court case on this, we need to have full disclosure and independent legal advice. That's clear. And you can't override the claim by any child of the marriage. And you've got to make sure there's fairness there that there isn't a real need. But subject to that, this could work. Now, I, I mentioned 28 days that the prenup has to be 28 days before the wedding. That isn't actually in the Supreme Court or in statute. It's a proposal for something that a, a law reform proposal but the important thing is that it's not the last minute so there's no question of duress at the bottom of this slide i referenced the archers if any of you listen to the radio for a drama series um, they made there were two classic clangers made in the archers on prenups one was it was a last minute just before the wedding let's have a prenup oh golly what did that mean the wedding was off um you know a <laughs> bad result the, the second case was another bad result, which was a, a case where parents made the offer to their daughter and then a bit later on they said, well, you should have a prenup. And oh, don't do that. Don't do that later because it looks so much like actually we don't trust the other half when in fact, you know, actually it, it's not that it doesn't need to be that it can be simply being cautious. So if you're going to do it, I think it's worth encouraging clients to do it all in one go to do a, what I call here a package to make the offer of help on the basis of a prenup. And I've said on this slide here, blame the pesky lawyers. You know, it's the like lawyers who've said you've got to do this. And, 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 and also that it's the same for all the children. You know, it's not just you, all your siblings will, will have this, will make the same offer to them. And I think if you say that, I think a prenup is workable. So I, I hope that that looks like a really serious option because it is. 
But the one other option to explore is, is the Declaration of Trust on 1.12. And I'm afraid that's one I'm going to knock down pretty quickly, which is it, you know, you, you, you say a Declaration of Trust that the first 50,000 or whatever goes to X because X is the person who had the money from parents, but actually that can easily get forgotten on the next property purchase and it can be looked through on a divorce. That's the problem. So it seems to me you've got two real options. You've got a loan agreement for the second charge, or you've got a prenup or postnup. Those are your two options. And 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 I hope that that helps you with focusing on those. Um, a couple of other points to make. Uh, first of all, there's some IH couple of IHT issues um, on 113 where uh, we um, say, you know, the loan could be written off in stages if it is a loan, but it has to be done by deed. And um, do think about what the effect is for the rest of the family, including the effect of the gift for inheritance tax, because if the mum dies or the parent or the the, the the donor dies within seven years, then that will have the first dibs of the, on, on, on the net nil rate band. So it means more tax on the rest of the estate. It's really worth making sure that is factored into the thinking because that's the sort of thing many clients have not thought through. The important thing here is that clients can make an informed decision with proper advice, which brings me to my, my final slide uh, and the practice points. And it's so important that people do take advice and that we work together on this. We lawyers need to work cross-disciplinary. We need to, we private client people need to work with residential property and family. But also we need to liaise with, with those of you who are financial planners, because I do think the financial planning advice is really important. What can you afford to gift or to loan? What are the options for raising funds uh, if, if there isn't cash immediately available? And let's just shout, have a shout out for that cash flow modeling because, because it's such an invaluable tool. I talk about it a lot in my training because it's a great opportunity to show clients what the options are, to look at the different uh, options. I mean, those of you who use it as financial planners won't need telling how wonderful it is, but it is, it is a great opportunity to illustrate for clients the potential alternatives available to them. So I think there's, there's a lot of estate planning we can do together here. And I hope that I've given you a few insights on that. Um, I've, I've, I've actually got one more slide, which is a slide just to reference for the firm. Uh, we contributed, um, 15 of us in the firm wrote the Law Society's IHT Planning Handbook. I was privileged to be the editor of this. Um, and I am so, so grateful to a succession of chancellors who've not changed the law so that it's still, still, still good practice and the, the, the IHT practice is good and the figures are still good. Um, still, you know, the 325, the 175 and so on. So, um, but it just as to mention it in case any of you are interested because it is not just for lawyers, it's for anybody who advises on IHT planning. So there we are. Um, let's now move on to uh, one of our uh, partners who heads our Chichester team to Naomi Neville and Naomi is going to address the issue of pensions in estate planning. So uh, over to you Naomi, thank you. Thank you John. Um, uh, in today's session I've, I've put, set out an agenda on the next slide um, so I'm going to briefly uh, cover the uh, current tax position for pensions um, and also take a quick look at the potential changes that may be coming. Um, and secondly, I'm going to consider at high level uh, the benefits of careful and collaborative estate planning, um, looking at the pensions, particularly in lifetime, and also consider the place of trusts in this picture. Um, and then finally, uh, going to look at the key practical points for planning after the death of a pension holder and outline how the estate plan can then be put into effect. Um, so first on 2.2, on the, the status quo really. So we're all likely to be aware of, of the large changes to pension taxation that, that came in 2015, um, which really shifted um, the nature of a pension from, for, from being a vehicle purely for saving a secure income for retirement into a more tax efficient estate planning vehicle. And the IHT efficiency that, that pensions have means that it is potentially tempting to assume there's no need to carefully consider pension planning other than in lifetime maximising the use of the pension um, perhaps as a long-term um, investment pot. But 
but really what I want to talk through today is how this isn't the case and actually even though um, people uh, in their estate planning and writing wills often sort of put the pensions to one side it really is important to consider the pension alongside um, everything together. Um, there is much more choice now for pension holders in how they can use their pension pot personally and also um, the fact that they can nominate beneficiaries to receive the pension as a whole um, in addition to receiving lump sums or um, having an income uh, perhaps by way of an annuity purchase um, really um, expands what was available before. Um, subject to the particular scheme rules of any one pension it is it is generally possible to, to pass on the pension um, to nominated individuals as I've said so for example the spouse children grandchildren of a, of a pension holder um, the the 2015 legislation um, also abolished the old 55 percent income tax rate which applied to some death benefits um, and broadly replaced it with charges at marginal rates of the recipients um, and on slide 2.3 i've set out um, very um, broad detail um, the tax treatment of, of these death benefits and many of you on the call will will know about this in greater depth but and the, and the detail is beyond the scope of, of the webinar really today. But there are key elements here which impact on estate planning directly and I think are worth highlighting briefly. So at the moment, as the tax law is currently, if a pension holder dies before the age of 75, there would be no tax charges on lump sums paid out um, to third parties um, uh, within two years of death or if um, they uh, nominate an income, uh, either a flexi drawdown or, or via purchase of an annuity, within that two year period, that decision needs to be made. Um, and if the current draft legislation is passed without amendment, then um, in future there, there will be charges on lump sums, um, but only those which are in excess of the new lump sum and death benefit allowance that will be coming in uh, next tax year. And these, would be at beneficiaries marginal rates these charges so it's it's still not a um a completely um taxed environment there is some scope for tax free lump sums if they're below that allowance which is going to initially be set we think at the same level as the current lifetime allowance but for death after the 75th birthday beneficiaries are taxed at marginal rates on all receipts and so there would are there are no lump uh, sorry no tax free lump sums after that um birthday and this position appears likely to remain unchanged if the proposed legislation and this, the policy set out in the attached papers becomes law. On slide 2.4 I move into sort of the main area of focus today which is really the interaction between estate planning and, and pensions. Um, pensions are outside of a pension holder's free estate and the free est by free estate here I mean the assets they can control via their will. And um, the decisions about how the pension is used after death are made by um, the pension trustee. Um, and it, it sort of full control of the pension holder would be in conflict with the pension pot being outside of the estate for IHT purposes anyway. So this discretion that the pension trustee has is really important. Our experience tells us that even with nomination forms completed by pension holders, um, which can influence the decisions of the pension trustee, the trustee isn't bound to follow those. And pension trustees often seek information um, beyond the nomination form to inform their decisions. And they may even consider things like the content of the deceased's will, um, even though really it's it's completely irrelevant. And they, they may liaise with executors and consult with family members before reaching a decision. Um, now, for a pension holder who's taken time to consider their estate plan, um, there may be really, really good reasons for um, the wished for distributions from the pension being distinct from the manner in which the will distributes the free estate and potentially for those clients it's a big disadvantage that their wishes might be ignored and so what we as lawyers and also um, financial advisors and tax advisors can do in lifetime is to help the, the pension holder look at their arrangements and help them improve the likelihood of their, their wishes being followed. Um, on the next slide I've really focused on um, maximising the effect of the nomination form which is really um, the main way that the pension holder can can um, influence the decisions of the trustee. 
Um, a well-advised pension holder, um, hopefully having uh, sought collaborative advice from their financial advisor's lawyer and, and also considered tax, will have a more detailed bespoke drafted nomination. Um, this nomination could include guidance as to the background for the wishes. Um, it could be quite, I say directive, but guiding um, to the pension trustees not to consult the executors or review a will, for example, and set out the reasons why that's very different. Uh, but really the key thing for any nomination, however it's drafted, is it needs to be updated very regularly, um, ideally at least once a year or if there are any major changes in the interim. And updating it and, and refreshing it could be as simple as printing an identical version and re-signing and redating it each year. Um, and the, the key reason for this is that having a completely up-to-date nomination makes it much harder for pension trustees to find reasons to ignore the content of it. The, the pension holder should be advised carefully about who to nominate, even if they want to keep something very simple. So, for example, um, for a married person leaving a spouse, they may well um, have an intention for their spouse to have full benefit if they survive. But um, if, if there's no naming of anyone else other than the spouse, then nobody else um, can, the only thing pension trustees can then do is pay out a lump sum. They can't transfer the pension to someone else or invest in annuity for the benefit of others. So we, we advocate often naming spouse and children and grandchildren, even if those others are nominated only for a small percentage of the pot. But this also allows flexibility to adapt to change circumstances and makes clear who should benefit if the pension holder and spouse die in fairly quick succession or without the pension holder updating their form. For a pension holder who's really keen to have greater control, um, a nomination into a discretionary trust set up in lifetime purely for the purposes of receiving pension death benefits. Um, now, this is sometimes called a, a spousal bypass or a pension bypass trust, um, but is really just a, a pilot discretionary trust set up in lifetime. And then the nomination um, can nominate the trust as, as the beneficiary of the pension um, or lump sum from it. But the you, the nomination can also be mixed. So once that trust is created, the nomination form can say a part, a percentage of the pot could be to the trust and the rest could be to spouse, children, grandchildren to keep that flexibility open. And the nomination can also guide pension trustees um, to consult with the trustees of the pilot discretionary trust post death so that they ensure that their decision regarding funding of the trust versus funding um, transferring rights to individual nominees is considered um, as the pension holder would hope for. Um, I have a straightforward case study to work through um, the potential options here and that's on the next slide. Um, so in this example, Chris is the pension holder and he's married to Mary. They have two adult children and their starting point is a desire to look after each other post first death and then treat their children fairly. They do have some concerns about their oldest child's marriage. They're not sure about the relationship. They're not sure about its stability, but they also don't get on very well with their child's spouse. And um, their youngest child has a lot of independent wealth and um, doesn't need any additional inheritance. And so as part of their own estate planning, they've asked Chris and Mary to bypass them and benefit their children instead. And Chris and Mary are happy to do this. Um, Chris and Mary have a joint free estate, including their home, of about £2 million. Pounds. And um, in addition, Chris's pension pot is about 700000 So a common approach, a straightforward approach, um, would see Chris nominating the bulk of his pension to Mary, as he's keen for her to be supported in retirement if he dies first. But as I've said, he should also include other family members in that straightforward nomination. Chris uh, might also have a simple will prepared, likely a mirror will with his wife, um, in which they can leave everything to each other on first death and then on second death a split of the estate in two halves, eldest child receiving their own and the youngest child um, share perhaps going to their own children. This arrangement does raise some flags with me um, and uh, probably with you as well. Um, if Chris dies first and Mary 
elects to take a lump sum, um, she will have an estate which is then worth 2.7 million. And if we're looking at the wider estate planning, um, the effect of the taper on the residence nil rate band and the transferable nil rate band will lead overall to an increased liability on Mary's subsequent death. And assuming that she hasn't spent uh, money and the, the effect of imp inflation is minimal, there will also be more in her estate to be taxed, so quite the significant extra IHT liability. But in addition, if we look at the protective aspects, there really is a lack of protection here for um, the pe pension assets and the free estate um, in the event of influence of the eldest child's spouse or perhaps a divorce. But we also have some young beneficiaries here who need um, protection, arguably. And for the near future, those younger beneficiaries may in fact have lower marginal rates applying to income tax um, in any um, event and they, there therefore is a, a possibility of looking at greater tax efficiency by perhaps distributing pension to those lower rate taxpayers while perhaps giving more to the higher rate taxpayers from the free estate. Um, now, obviously, looking at that more sort of flexible arrangement, we would need some kind of a crystal ball to be able to fix that exactly right now um, to suit the time when Chris dies. So um, fixed nominations and outright gifts under the will don't really help us with that. And this is where a more flexible solution might be appropriate. And I've outlined that in slide 2.7. Um, the case study here is exactly the same, same family, same goals, but instead of the more straightforward nomination, Chris um, includes a nomination to a pilot discretionary trust for at least some of his pension pot. And um, one key benefit of this on Mary's death is that we can more easily manage the uh, keeping her estate below the two million pounds and get her those two full residence Norway bands on death. Um, which could save up to £140,000 inheritance tax. Um, but in addition, it reduces um, her estate anyway for, for tax purposes. Um, the couple here could also make a decision to structure their wills for flexibility and greater options for post-death planning with the free estate too. And um, here, this is really... Uh, a lot of detail to be covered potentially in another session, but the use of a nil rate band trust is really helpful um, with this. Um, and particularly when we think about residence nil rate band planning first uh, post first death and keeping the estate smaller, perhaps making use of um, valuation of jointly held assets to minimise the value of what's left in Mary's estate further. And of course, keeping a discretionary trust on second death in the will allows additional protection and flexibility to react to the family needs and circumstances at the time. Um, it still doesn't fully get over some of those concerns if the eldest child divorces, but it, it goes some way to ensuring they don't have an outright gift immediately on death of their parents. So some of you may already be thinking it's all well and good. She's talking about this legal solution again. But what about um, the major downside of a pension lump sum being paid into a discretionary trust post death? And that takes us on to slide 2.8. Um, and what I'm referring to here, of course, is the um, tax on the lump sum payment. Um, which applies if the pension holder dies after the age of 75 and in future potentially on bigger lump sum payments into trust in any event. This may well be very off-putting to some pension holders. There are opportunities in post-death planning to minimise this liability over the lifetime of the trust um, by, for example, making distributions to basic rate taxpayers who can then claim back um, the other, the rest of the tax paid. Um, but this doesn't fully resolve the issues of things like lost growth um, in investments because we've lost the inability to invest that 45% that's been spent in tax and of course obviously the lost capital gains tax and income tax exemptions that would be available when that money is held in the pension wrapper itself. But really what we're talking about here is not comparing retaining the pension, it's looking at um, paying sort of paying to Mary directly versus a trust and um, and also versus paying out to the children instead, which obviously doesn't give Mary access. And so the answer for each client would be very different and we need to weigh up all of these fairly complicated issues, um, the tax issues, the control um, benefits of a trust, the protection, the flexibility. And our role as advisors is to really guide our clients through and help them to 
resolve which is the um, overall best um, fit to their personal aims. <laughs> but um, for a pension holder with strong views on what they really want to happen to their pension pot, the fact they can choose their own trust trustees for the pilot discretionary trust is a huge plus. And in terms of um, flexibility, the, 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 once the money is in that discretionary trust, there's a much greater way that those trustees can benefit the family members. So, for example, they can buy property which a beneficiary lives in, they can lend money to a beneficiary and they can even pay um, assets to third parties for the benefit of a beneficiary, all of which is, is wider than would be possible um, under the pension. Um, and there's also flexibility in distributing lump sums over a longer period of time, making decisions about them after that, that two year point. Um, so, so there's a lot of flexibility and that allows the post-death planners to understand all the circumstances of the family, their individual needs at the time of that death and also know what the tax regime is applying at that point and come up with a solution that suits everyone best. Now I know this still doesn't really um, resolve the fact that um, a client may is quite likely to live beyond 75 and those larger tax charges arise after that point. But of course, if we're working with working age people and they're setting in place their nominations for their pension as it's building, really we should be offering them an opportunity to review their nominations and review their estate plan as they approach 75. And um, they could always change their nomination at that point and move away from the discretionary trust option then. Um, so the next slide, um, this is sort of some practical points about the post-death planning. When a pension holder dies and assuming all's been well set up, the, the really key thing is for the deceased advisors to, between them, know and understand who's going to take the lead role, liaising with the pension trustee or the scheme administrator, but that they all then work together, um, working with the family, working with financial advice, working with legal advice and tax um, advice to consider the pension alongside the estate as a whole. Um, looking on the next slide, we can turn back to Chris and Mary and you'll see that we've moved forward a little bit in time, albeit that I've assumed for now that we're still within the current tax regime. And we can see that Chris sadly passed away at the age of 74, um, survived by Mary and his children and grandchildren. Um, and but, but here he had undertaken that more detailed planning that we set out um, under option two earlier. Um, he did set out in his nomination form that he wanted the pension trustees to ignore the content of his will, but he would, if they wished to consult with anybody, um, like them to consider what the, the trustees of the pilot discretionary trust um, would like to achieve um, before deciding whether or not to pay any to the trust or whether to, to go with the other individuals nominated. Um, tax efficiency remains a goal for the family, but Mary's still relatively young and she is concerned about the years she might have left to live and her future financial security. Um, the pension trustees decide in this example after consultation that they can and will pay the whole lump sum into, a dis into the discretionary trust. Because Chris died before he's 75, there's no tax on the lump sum payment at the moment. The trustees then exercise their discretion to lend the entire fund to Mary. Um, that gives her the freedom to spend the funds during her lifetime without having to uh, consistently go to the trustees and, and deal with all of that. But it um, maintains the efficiency uh, in terms of tax of the structure that's set up because on Mary's death, her estate will owe that £700,000 back to the discretionary trust. And as long as it's actually repaid, that can be deductible for IHT purposes from her estate. And during Mary's lifetime, this does reduce the compliance obligations on the trust and minimises um, things like the, the um, relevant property regime, 10 yearly charges, etc. And also there, there will then be no income or capital gains to um, pay tax on during that time. Now, this won't be the right solution for every family, but um, it is an option and there are multiple other options which can meet different needs and different requirements. But all of those options are only possible if there has been careful and flexible planning in lifetime. So turning now to my last slide, um, I just want to sort of summarise and highlight 
the real need for all of us as professional advisors to be working together for our clients on this. Um, we've really rattled through some of the key ways we can better support clients with estate planning um, with their pensions. And um, we've looked a little bit about the lifetime planning and how we might support bereaved family members to implement those plans. But it, what is clear at all stages of that, um, we can only really achieve the best outcome for our clients if we collaborate with each other and we bring our overlapping but distinct skills together um, in the interests of each individual client. Um, so on that note, I will pass back to John. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, that, that's great. Uh, a remittal reminder that uh, any questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'd be pleased to try and answer any questions you have. And now I'm very pleased to be interested to introduce uh, Ian Bond, who is the partner who heads our Birmingham team, uh, to talk about this, this kind of important subject about vulnerable beneficiaries, particularly who those who qualify as disabled persons. Ian. Thank you, uh, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, John said earlier, solicitors like trusts, and so I have to sort of start with I'm a solicitor and I like trusts. Now, trust law has developed over centuries. There is a very long, rich history of case law and precedents playing out over the years, generations, um, building up and developing a body of law. What I'm going to talk about today is all relatively new in that, and these are all creatures of statute. So it can be quite dry, um, but I will try and liven it up. And I'll go sort of straight in uh, with the basics. Trusts, um, where the trustees are resident in England and Wales, will be taxed for inheritance tax purposes in one of two ways. It says it on the slide there, they will either be taxed as a qualifying interest in possession trusts, where the value of the trust fund is treated as being a particular beneficiary in their estate for the purposes of calculating inheritance tax, or the alternative is the relevant property regime trusts. And this is where the value is in no one's estate, but the trust itself is taxed on the value of the assets within it at specific times. Now, there are um, certain trusts which qualify from a relief from being within the relevant property uh, uh, regime and the relevant property regime charges, but these are limited and usually for the benefit of vulnerable people. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the Finance Act of uh, 2006 introduced significant changes about inheritance tax and the treatment of trusts. And this means that uh, almost all all intervirus trusts, so trusts which are created during a settler's lifetime after the 22nd of March 2006, which was budget day that particular year, will be treated as relevant property regime trusts, the only exemption being the disabled persons trust. And in general, um, uh, you know, vulnerable people are people who are unable to look after themselves, look after their finances, and trusts for vulnerable people will benefit for from uh, a favourable tax treatment. And this is where Parliament has recognised that parents and family members may want to provide for the future financial security of those who are unable to manage funds for themselves, either because of their age or because of a physical or mental impairment. Now, the two types of tr vulnerable trusts there are the bereaved minor trusts there, and that's again a creature of statue, um, and that's a person who's under the age of 18 and whose parents passed away, or a person who is defined as mental, uh, mentally or physically disabled person, a disabled person's beneficiary. And today we're only going to look at uh, the disabled person's trust. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll see what the details uh, are, of those are. So 3.2. It's a creature statute. It sets out you know, two important requirements. The, the beneficiaries must qualify and the trust structure must qualify. And we will look at those in detail over the coming slides. Um, but for setting out what the basics are, what it sets on there is for, an, uh, for a disabled person's interest, for inheritance tax purposes, um, a trust for a disabled person that meets these requirements on how the income and capital of the trust is dealt with um, a, if it's applied during that person's lifetime. And for income and capital gains tax purposes, um, specifically in relation to the taxation of trust, that vulnerable person, an election has to be made. And there's a specific form, which we've got the link on there, uh, which must be uh, an election made by both the trustees and that vulnerable person for each tax year they would like the election to uh, apply. So um, the aim of the special tax treatment um, is to protect trusts that which have vulnerable beneficiaries by ensuring the amount charged for income tax and for capital gains tax arising to the trustees is no more than would have been the income tax and the capital gains which would have arisen for the vulnerable beneficiary. So let's look at how the beneficiary qualifies. So um, slide 3.3. Three. 
Um, and again, it's set out in the statute um, and it sets out that to qualify a disabled person is someone who at the time the property is transferred into the settlement is, and the first bullet point we'll concentrate on now, uh, is incapable by reason of mental disorder as identified in the Mental Health Act of 1983 of administering their property or managing their affairs. So staying with that bit for a moment, we note that it's the Mental Health Act of 1983, not the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, which we may be more um, attuned to and may know more about. The Mental Capacity Act has a presumption of capacity, uh, which is decision specific. The Mental Health Act does not. It works in a very different perspective. Um, uh, but generally speaking, a person who lacks capacity under the Mental Capacity Act will also lack capacity under the Mental Health Act. And there is statutory definitions. Again, these are creatures of statute. A mental disorder is defined as anyone who has a disorder or disability of the mind in the Mental Health Act. And from a perspective, we deal with this from HMRC and they understand and accept that anyone with an Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, a bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, uh, autism can all be regarded as disabled persons. Um, so long as their conditions mean the person involved is incapable of administering their property or managing their affairs. Um, and it's imp important to note because it's under the Mental Health Act, not the Mental Capacity Act, dependence on drug and alcohol is expressly outside the Mental Health Act definitions. But if the relevant uh, conditions apply at the time the assets are transferred into the trust, the trust itself will be uh, uh, clearly established. And if we need to actually have a trust established by a will, it's the criteria being a beneficiary who qualifies at the date of the death. Now, if we move into slide 3.4, we'll see that the second part of it is about being on certain benefits. So there are six main benefits. The three at the top are the ones we will count uh, most often in day to day life. Um, so attendance allowance, uh, disability living allowance and personal independent payment. So AA, DLA and PIP. Um, and it must be, and it says right at the top there, in receipt of, not merely eligible for. Um, and we have the criteria that are all set out there. Now, if a, if a person is no longer in receipt of sorry, uh, one of the benefits, say, for example, attendance allowance, they still can qualify as a vulnerable person, so long as the reason for non-receipt is they've been admitted to a certain type of care, generally speaking, uh, yeah, paid for by the public or by local funds. So if someone's in hospital for a period of time, they're not getting their attendance allowance, they still will qualify uh, as a vulnerable person. However, if someone is reassessed, um, so they've gone through a benefits assessment and they no longer qualify, then they will no longer meet the, uh, the definition of uh, being a beneficiary who qualifies for a disabled person's trust and the trust will lose its special tax status. So it's something to keep an eye on, keep under review. Um, a lot of this happened when there was a lot of reviews recently about uh, eligibility for personal independent payments. So um, there were times where if someone lost their entitlement, the, the trust itself would lose its uh, specific tax status. Status. Now, there's a lot of details in there, but effectively uh, for the for the main three attendance allowance, that's people who are 65 or over and who are getting the care component either at the lower or the higher rates. For the, the DLA, it's someone who's under the age of 65, but they are getting the criteria where they get the care component at the middle rate, um, so not the lower rates or at the highest rate or they get the mobility component at the highest rate. So it's not all DLAs that will um, uh, require, uh, uh, qualify on this basis. Um, for personal independence payments, it's someone who's between the age of 15 and 65, and they're getting the uh, daily living component either at the enhanced or standard rates or the mobility component at the enhanced or standard rates. So um, they're the benefits. It is a checklist exercise of going through, making sure what uh, the person is receiving, which benefit it is, uh, and do they qualify? So let's look at the structures now. So on 3.5, we see where the structures are. Now, there are two types of structures. Type one uh, is an actual interest in possession. These trusts are taxed as a qualifying interest in possession for inheritance tax purposes, even when they're created uh, by a lifetime settlement. And the second type, type two, is a deemed interest in possession. So the disabled person doesn't have an actual interest in possession in the trust where it's created but the trust um, provides that the application of the trust property during that disabled person's lifetime has to be for them and their benefit, so for the disabled person's benefit. Now that disabled person's interest is treated as a qualifying interest in possession for inheritance tax purposes. 
So they're the definitions. They are in statute um, um, and set out um, um, by statute. Now, each of these two types of trust can be created in one of two ways. There is the normal settlement that we would be used to where uh, either created during their lifetime or by their will, or there is a, the ability for self-settlement. So this gives us four types of uh, disabled person's interest. The four types are shown on the next slide at 3.6. So a lot of words on there, a lot of detail on there. Um, and basically, um, we've set out the variants of the diff uh, different types of trust and the four distinct types of disabled persons trust are listed on there. But the things to concentrate on are these can be set up by anybody that includes the disabled person themselves, um, uh, uh, provided um, that the person qualifies as being a disabled person, you know, that's the main criteria. And someone who has a condition which they believe will lead them to qualifying as a disabled person later in life, in the future can self settle as we said on the last slide and they can do that into either a discretionary trust or the uh, life interest trust and that gives you the four that are on the bullet points there and it's really important to know all of these types of trusts that we're creating for the disabled persons trust they are all outside the relevant property regime and are not subject to the potential 20 percent entry charge for creating a trust they're not subject to the 10-year anniversary charges and the exit charges for inheritance tax they are as they qualify um, as interest in possession trusts uh, as a gift into a disabled persons trust they are potentially exempt transfers um, from inheritance tax purposes and self-settlement into either of these types of trusts is not a chargeable in, uh, occasion for inheritance tax purposes because it's treated as the property is remaining in the settler's estate. So it's really important. It's highlighted in red there at the bottom. So, um, you know, th th it's really important to actually see these distinctions for our clients for the advice that we are actually giving. Um, one of the questions we often come about this is, what is the inheritance tax position on the death of the disabled person? So where a disabled person's interest ends on their death, then um, there will be a chargeable transfer for inheritance tax. The assets within the disabled person's trust um, that's held for their benefit will be aggravate, uh, aggregated with the other assets that they hold. So there will be a potential uh, uh, charge to inheritance tax depending on their own independent uh, their, uh, circumstances. Um, although it's a discretionary trust for IHT purposes, um, the disabled beneficiary, as we have said, is treated as having the interest in possession. So it really does you know, move it out of the regime. Um, and it's important to remember that whilst the inheritance tax uh, advantages for qualifying trusts are automatic, so it's automatically uh, in the legislation how it works, for CGT and income tax uh, uh, advantages, it is dependent on the trustees and the beneficiary, the vulnerable beneficiary, completing uh, the vulnerable person election, the, the, the form that we saw beforehand. And to claim that special tax treatment for income tax and capital gains tax, they fill in the v, uh, VP1, they send it to HMRC along with the uh, vulnerable beneficiary or some other person who signs it on their behalf. Um, and the trustees give details of all the assets and the income in that qualifying trust. So there's a, a, a administrative exercise for completing the VP. E1. It's not too particularly onerous, but there is some information that needs to be dealt with. Now, if that vulnerable person dies or is deemed to be no longer vulnerable, um, so they no longer qualify, then the special, uh, that special tax treatment for capital gains tax and for income tax uh, is no longer effective after that date. So the day they no longer qualify or the day they pass away. Um, so it is possible um, for a beneficiary to cease being a vulnerable beneficiary during um, uh, the tax year and that's something uh, that the trustees need to be aware of because it will impact on their income tax and their capital gains tax returns for that particular tax year. So there's a lot on that slide um, but if we look at the next slide now I've set it out on a table which may help sort of uh, compare and contrast you know, the positions of a disabled persons trust compared to a, a standard discretionary trust as it were. Um, and a disabled persons trust works similar in a way to the discretionary trust. The main difference is between the two is that they are taxed differently. The disabled person needs to satisfy criteria for the benefit to uh, uh, that they receive from the disabled persons trust. Now, what we do see in practice, sadly, is many advisors tend to steer clients who may qualify and may be may benefit from a disabled persons trust away from setting up a disabled persons trust, citing the the, the flexibility of a discretionary trust as the key factor. Now, given 
Owen Mitchell's wide experience of advising families who may have adult children with learning difficulties or, or, or other ways that they qualify, our general view is that most families would choose the uh, 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 to rather than a discretionary trust to have a specific um, disabled persons trust route once all these advantages and the issues to consider have been clearly explained to them. So there are a lot of benefits and we sort of mentioned the qualifying criteria. Um, um, so let's uh, sort of move to uh, 3.8 and look at some of the limitations and some of the things that are specific. So there are limitations um, as to who can benefit now, but the historic position of the first at the top, so where trusts were created up to 8th of April 2013 and the position now if you were creating them after April uh, 2013, so that position now. Um, uh, and uh, so you've got the compare and contrast. Now, the important thing is to put this in the context. So, uh, you know, a discretionary trust, as the name suggests, we've talked about that, um, means the trustees have complete discretion to decide how the funds are used and for whose benefit. So a discretionary trust will have a range, a pool of beneficiaries who can potentially benefit um, uh, from the trust assets, and it's the trustees who decide who's to get them. Now that pool is referred to as a class of beneficiaries, usually formed by children, grandchildren, other descendants, other family members, um, and it can include things like charities, you know, there's a wide range. Now, the uh, Disabled Person Trust is very similar to the Discretionary Trust. They can include a range and a class of beneficiaries in the same way who can potentially benefit. However, the key difference is the Disabled Person Trust has to have a disabled person named as the principal beneficiary for who the trust fund is to be used in the main during that beneficiary's lifetime. Now, the trustees still have a degree of discretion over the trust fund. They don't have to advance funds for the principal beneficiary on a regular basis, but they are limited as to how much money or assets can be applied for the benefit of the other beneficiary, so that wider pool during the principal's lifetime. Now, by law, this limitation is currently capped at the lower of £3,000 or 3% of the trust value as it sets on the screen. So there's no limitation of how much money can be applied for the benefit of the principal beneficiary, the disabled person during their lifetime, but there is a limit on how much it can be used for other people's benefits. So um, uh, that's um, with the theory. Let's look at some of the sort of the practicalities that come with it. So on slide three, nine, um, you know, one of the big questions is, you know, why might your clients want to set up a disabled uh, person's uh, trust? Now, we talked about the tax reasons, you know, I've discussed, uh, you know, the disabled person's trust can be advantageous from a tax point um, for your clients. You know, your, if your clients or have a child or a family member who qualifies as a disabled person, you should consider advising those clients of how um, they can use uh, you know, a disabled person's trust so that that person's financial needs will be looked after in the event that that client uh, you know, eventually passes away. So who's going to look after the disabled person when they're gone? Um, uh, so we've got the tax positions and we've got the family planning because we can protect the disabled person who might otherwise be vulnerable to financial abuse or exploitation from others. Or, you know, it may be that, um, you know, that, that rather than relying on family members to do the right thing to look after the disabled person after the client's death, you know, it could be risky, their circumstances can change, um, you know, they may no longer be able to look after the disabled person, you can actually sort of, you know, put this in place during the client's lifetime so it's up and running and they know that the it's working for them um and so it sort of leads on to that second point about you know the timing you know do the do clients do this on their death so they set up disabled persons trust in their will or doing do they do it during their lifetime? And by setting up a disabled person's trust in their lifetime, clients can ensure the disabled person's needs are protected in the tax efficient ways we've said, but the recommendation, and we at Owen Mitchell usually recommend that clients set up the trust during their lifetime, not only because th their estate can pass into the trust via their will so they can transfer assets later on, but they can also do it during their lifetime. They can assign other things. So, you know, the, the death in service benefits or other investments can be transferred into the disabled person's trust as they go along. This can help their clients with their own inheritance tax planning and estate planning. And going forward, it means that other family members such as grandparents, aunts and uncles of the disabled person can transfer assets into a trust that already exists uh, you know, rather than leaving them a, a cash legacy or something in their wills and making sure that any means tested benefits aren't um, aren't affected by the receipt of cash as a gift um, later on. 
um, if they are doing it during their lifetime, it's, it's important you talk to your clients always to, if they're setting up a lifetime um, disabled person's trust, that they update their will um, and they also talk to their family members to make sure, depending on the different family circumstances, that they gift it into the trust that's already in existence rather than outright gifts. Sometimes we ask questions about who can be trustees um, and uh, you know, clients, if they're doing it during their lifetime, you know, trustees can be anyone who's over the age of 18 and not suffering from any form of mental incapacity themselves. Um, it is an onerous role. It, it comes great power, great responsibility being a trustee. Um, so clients are going to choose their trustees wisely. And if they set it up during their lifetime, they can see how they get on, make sure they've made the right choices, as it were. So they're confident that these people are able to take on the task and look after that disabled and vulnerable person. Could be members of the family, could be close friends, could be trusted professional advisors. Owen oh, Mitchell, we have our trust corporation to act uh, on you know as professional trustees uh, as and when needed um, so we've set up the trust during the lifetime that's what our advice would be and what we'd also advise if we go on to the next slide is the fact of saying that we will do it with a letter of wishes now Naomi's already mentioned about letters of wishes as a lovely little definition of what they are at the top now the letter of wishes is something that the settlers who are providing for a disabled you know, adult child perhaps um, would make it clear that um, the trustees have to clear discretion over the trust funds but they can give some ideas of how they wish the trust funds to be used for the benefit of that disabled person during their lifetime you know perhaps mentioning that funds not to be paid out into the bank account of the disabled person if it risks them losing state funded care um, can mention different things that they would like the funds to be made available for so perhaps holidays for the disabled person adaptive cars all the things that may not be covered by benefits now letters of wishes as Naomi said you know can be updated they give guidance to the trustees of what should be done um, and they can also give guidance of what should be done once the disabled person has died so how the trust fund will be divided between the remaining pool of beneficiaries, the children, the grandchildren, the charities, but yeah, you know, various proportions. The thing it does say um, on there, and just to note, um, a letter of wishes is not legally binding and the trustees still have the freedom to decide on all of these points. But in practice, you know, trustees would tend to follow the, the terms, the gist of the letter of wishes. Um, uh, and it's because it's not legally binding, um, the letters of wishes can be updated at any time. So as circumstances change, you know, the, those letters of wishes, those instructions from the family can be updated. And it's part of that flexibility, which is uh, the appeal. And the last thing to say to me, just to sort of wind it uh, up, is the last slide. Um, uh, one of the differences, it was mentioned on that table, is that uh, trusts that are under the uh, disabled uh, person's uh, regime do not have to register on HMRC's trust registration service where uh, a discretionary trust that clients um, create during their lifetime will have to be registered. Um, so that's uh, an important point for an administrative uh, benefit from there. But I think that was a very much a quick run through. Um, and so I'll hand back to John to, 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 to handle the questions. Well, thank, thank you very much, Ian. And um, uh, and and I think we've 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 had all had so much to say that we've actually slightly kind of overrun our time. So apologies for that. And some of you may have had to to leave us, but hopefully catch up on the recording. Just to say that if there are any questions, I'm going to take one in a moment. But if there are any questions that you've got, um, please do get in touch with us. All our contact details on the screen, uh, and you will get the slides sent through to you. We'll be pleased to follow up with you afterwards with any questions you may have. Um, one very interesting question about the. Um, the age of 75 and why that's not been changed given that the uh, retirement age has moved forward. I think there's quite a few bits of legislation that re re that revolve around the age of 75. Um, I, I I always felt when the changes were made by George Osborne that that in in, in the whole pension treatment that that actually it was quite generous and that some changes were coming. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in April because that is the big the first big change to that legislation, and more may follow. So let's watch that space uh, because I think it is a it's it's definitely a moving target. But I hope for the moment we've answered some of the things that you have in your minds. But do come back separately with any questions you may have. Uh, please do fill in the feedback form um, that will, will be in the Q&A box. And we'd be pleased to have your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And we hope that this is of use to you. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much, everybody.